Well, good morning, everyone, on an overcast Saturday morning. I am Dave Riccio. He is Matt Allen. This is Bumper to Bumper Radio, heard here every Saturday from 11 to noon on 92.3 KTAR. At Bumper to Bumper Radio, we are helping you, the motoring public, have a better overall car experience, even if you're an automotive hypochondriac. The best way we know how to do that is to educate you on your car. And you can get a hold of us at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. And we're going to try something a little bit new today is you can text questions to 411-923. And uh, we'll see if we can work the, the dials. I'm not really too sure about it. But uh, anyhow, automotive fact or fiction, some open phones and open texting. Are you requesting services you don't really need? And are you skipping the ones you do? There's a lot of that going on out there. Well, Dave, I think it's uh, sometimes be careful what you ask for because you might just get it. <laughs> <laughs> right. When it comes to auto repair, there, a lot of people will come in and 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 very well may end up spending money or wasting money on something that they don't need because they're going off of maybe old information or what used to be. Uh, you know, one of the common things is, oh, I – People might call and want a price or just come in and say, I just need a tune-up. Mm, that's like the most common one. Give me a tune-up. That'll I, fix my problem. I think that's a, that's that's one of them, yeah, for sure. And and that maybe used to be the way it was in the 70s or the 80s, maybe even in the lead-up in the early 90s when you had the 10-year-old cars that were needing the service. Yeah, you needed spark plugs every 30,000 miles. There was spark you know, plug wires at 60. Yeah, Cap, rotor, yeah. points, condenser. Points condenser, which they haven't had in, in years. But the whole you know, term tune-up really means tuning. You're adjusting, you're tuning, you're tweaking, you're, you're doing whatever you need to do to make the car run better. So before they got complicated and sophisticated, yeah, you, you got to tune-up every year maybe, every 30,000 miles. Car ran a lot stronger after a tune-up. I don't even think it's in your owner's manual. You can't even find tune-up. I, I mean, you can tie, find a spark plug change. Well, yeah, and, and 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 that's what I was going to say. Well, what is a tune-up? That's so subjective now. Tune-up, like we said, was points, plugs, condenser, adjust the carburetor, set this, put the probe in the tailpipe, see what's coming out. Well, you don't do it anymore. The None car is constantly tuning, constantly. So a tune-up now is basically replacing the spark plugs, but that's not really a tune-up. And I guess the point here is people come in, thinking that a tune-up is going to solve that problem. Or the other common one is, and we see this in the summertime, I need, yeah, I, I'm just going to go get my oil change done, and I want a cooling system flush, or or typically people would say radiator flush. And so if you're a service advisor at the counter, maybe you're at the car wash place where that's what they like to do. They like to do those flushes. You bet you. You want two? You know? <laughs> we got a special <laughs> on those. Special two today. <laughs> Only $10 more on Saturday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so... So you you, you know, so you get this flush. Well, in our shop, we're at the county. The service advisor is saying, well, wait a minute. Why do you want a flush? And this is part of that conversation that we're having and, and where sometimes people feel like they're being interrogated. But what is it that you want a flush for? Oh, well, it's overheating. So now the story starts to come out. Yes. Well, we're and- interrogating you for your own good because we don't want you throwing, spending good money after bad. And if you're having a – if the vehicle's running warm or overheating – my car is overheating. What do you think we should do? That would be the way to approach the approach the counter versus flush it out. I mean, nothing's going to change. And really, the last thing you want to do is overheat your car. So that needs to be taken care of because you don't want to blow a head gasket a week later. Well, I bet you see this one all the time, Dave. Uh, yeah, I got just go ahead. I want to get my transmission serviced. So, oh, is it due? Well, it's just it's not. You know, it jerks in between uh, second, third gear. It does this and that. A service probably isn't going to help. It may or may not hurt, but you might be getting rid of some of the evidence that's going to help oh, you. Oh, the find evidence the is what we're looking for. So a lot of people will come to us and they just had a transmission service because they were having a problem. So they're they're crossing their fingers, they're hoping for you know a service will fix it. So they go and they request a transmission service, and yet you know like you may be at the uh, lube shop or the car wash, say sure, no problem, we'll we'll service a transmission. They don't know if you need it or not, or maybe the fluid, maybe it's due, and maybe you do need it. But now it's at the transmission shop, and we're looking at it. We can't really tell what's going on with the transmission because we, lo- we lost the blood that we needed to check. So transmission service almost never fixes the problem. I mean, there is a couple cases and a couple instances where it does, but most of the time it doesn't. Well, it would be like going to the doctor and going, uh, okay, I'm going to need a script for uh, whatever, I don't know. 
pen, I need some penicillin. I need some uh, whatever. And uh, go ahead and write me up that order for this blood test. And uh, yeah, and the doctor's gonna be like, what? We're well, we're not just okay. Yeah, here's a shot. Yeah, bend over. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, and then and and then you know, people call in over the phone, and they're they're requesting prices on these things because they they would say, well, you know, I think I'm going to need a coolant flush because my car is running warm, warmer than I think it should be. So they're they're calling around trying to get a price on this coolant flush, and and really, people will sell it to you whether you need it or not. So I think it's best to go in with this is the problem, this is the symptom I'm having. What do you think? Now, in some instances, a tune-up will fix your car. If well, it happens to be, if a tune-up, as defined as, changes spark plugs and spark plug wires, you may have a you know fouled-out spark plug or spark plug's broken down, wire's broken down, and that happens to work in that instance. But you can spend a lot of money, go ahead and do the plugs and wires, and then you still got to fix the problem. Well, and what you were describing, too, a minute ago, Dave, is is how you really start going down the road. The, the wrong path. I mean, you're, you're headed for a disaster. So you're, pr- you're getting, you're out shopping for the lowest price on something that you think you need, <laughs> that you may or may not need. So price and maybe an old wives' tale or, or a 70s, 80s, early 90s thought process of, oh, well, I just need to flush it. Well, that's it. You and can... then you're going for the cheap thing. Now all of a sudden you're, you're, at some place that maybe we'll just do it and not be wanting to ask you those questions. You're going to create an extra step in the process. And I think I think people like to do that because I think they want to avoid, like, they think, well, if I can just get a transmission service, it's going to fix the transmission issue I'm having rather than the transmission shop sell me a transmission. So maybe that's some of the fear, and they're, they're just hoping for the best because people do not tell us right off the bat there's a problem. We've got a couple of uh, trick questions. So if you shop at Tri-City Transmission, we ask you on a scale of 1 to 10, how well do you think your transmission is working? Well, if they say eight, we get concerned. If they say ten, we're like, okay, we'll service it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but we want to make sure that we're not going to make a problem worse or aggravate it by. In- we're not going to be doing you any favors. We don't want that to happen. Well, and then there's another common one. We 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 Dave, we picked what four or five things. Tune up is one. Radiator flush. Your transmission service. What about alignment? Mm. We get people all the time. I need an alignment. This- well. Okay, so you start talking. What happens? Oh, the car shakes or it does this. Okay, that's not an alignment issue. So, again, it's it's bring in the problem. Let's let don't tell us what we need to do to fix your car. Help us know and understand what it is you're feeling. And, and what the symptom is so that we can take you down the right road. Well, speaking of alignment, uh, you know, people get an alignment because they think their car's pulling. Or maybe their steering wheel doesn't quite line up with the road. It's off a little bit. So those are going to be the couple things that people look for. And I was asking Matt before the show, because we don't do alignments. We're a transmission shop. Matt, what is the most common reason cars are pulling? Is it a tire pull? Yep. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the tire. Now, and you may the tire is what's causing the pull. Now, unless you went out and just clobbered a curb, or you're driving in Pothole City, wherever that is, or off road a lot, you probably don't need an, unless there's some event that all of a sudden, wow, I walloped the curb and now the car is pulling. Well, besides what you bent or damaged in the control arm, yeah, maybe you just need an alignment. But if you're just cruising down the road one day and then tomorrow your car is pulling to the right, mm. yeah, you may need an alignment by you know technicality or by measurement or whatever. But that alignment's not going to cure that problem. You've probably got a bad tire or some other issue. And vibrations are in alignment. That's right. I mean, it's tires out of balance, so that's tire balance. So if you get you get the shakes and the shimmies at the fifty-five and the sixty miles an hour, that's tire balance. Not hey, I need to go get an alignment. So I see those two get confused all the time between consumers. Does it need alignment? Does it need a tire balance? Now, alignment in general is not a bad idea. Just have an alignment check done every what every couple of years. Yeah, I would typically time an alignment around the event of replacing tires, uh, and that's something that your your tire shop, you know, discount S and S Tire, wherever wherever it is that you're having your tires done, your regular repair shop, you can tell. I mean, if the tires have are, are nice, even, smooth, worn out across the tread pattern, well. Yeah, you, in alignment, it may not be a bad idea, especially since you're making the investment in new tires. If you see the tires are chopped and cupped and and all goofed up, well, then, yeah, you definitely want to get, get in alignment. We've got Dan, Mark, Pat, Scott, and George, and we're taking phone calls at 602-277-5827. You can also text us at 411 
You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. My pappy said, son, you're going to drive me to drinking if you don't stop driving that hot rod Lincoln. Bumper to Bumper on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, here along with Matt Allen, who was very unmotivated when he got here this morning. And uh, I think I've cheered him, man. These cheered him up a little bit. clouds and overcast. Just, uh, this must be what it's like to live in Seattle. I don't know if I could handle that. I did enjoy a bike ride this morning with Michael Henry. And, uh, man, a good trail. You know, there was no traffic, which was good. So, anyhow... We are getting some text response. We're going to have to figure out how to do that. That's a little bit of overstimulation from my mind. <laughs> <laughs> On a gloomy Saturday morning, we're bringing in some new technology. I don't know. I'm well, let's nervous. go with Dan in Queen Creek on a 1999 Ford F-150. Go ahead, Dan. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, guys. Thanks for talking with me today. Hey, I got a, the 99 F-150, and it, when I start it, it seems to be making like a whirring noise coming from the engine, and then it sounds like the wheels are kind of not screeching but making a squeaking noise, not like it's a loose fan belt, but I do suspect that it is the fan belt, and I'm just not real sure before I replace it. I want to make sure that's the issue. Well, I'm thinking, I'm thinking well, if we've got a squealing or squeaking belt, you know, there's two concerns there. There's the belt as one, but there's also a belt tensioner that uh-huh. uh, that also plays into that. Do you, okay. Did you say the wheels were squeaking, like when you turn the wheels or when you actually no, drive? No, 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 like the, the pulleys, you know, okay. In, okay. inside. The, it sounds like it's the AC one um, when I have the AC running. It kind of makes like a... It's, they're not screeching like when you know you have a loose fan belt or whatever it makes that screech. It's not like that. It's kind of a low, sure. quieter um, squeaking, and, and it only happens after the initial whirring. And how many miles? Um, how many miles are in this truck? Just over two hundred thousand. Okay. Well, what you're going to want to do, what we're going to do in the, in the shop, most technicians when they look at that and they're going to hear that noise. Um, there's a couple things you can you can put some water on the pulleys and and if the oh I forget now if the noise goes away it's a tension issue if it uh, picks up it's an alignment issue I don't know I mean I don't I, know if I'm confident yeah. to go to Virginia Auto Service <laughs> come on now <laughs> but what we're gonna do we're gonna take the belt off the car and then we're gonna spin each individual pulley with two hundred thousand miles. You, if those are the original idlers and tensioners, yeah, I'm sure they need to be replaced. The manufacturers of these belts and tensioners now, Gates is one of the big OE manufacturers, they're saying they have about the same life cycle, about 60,000 miles. The belts are gone, and so are the so is the tensioners and the pulleys. And we're seeing that. A lot of them are plastic components and stuff. Not so much so on this 99 F-150, but... Uh, it's just a spring-loaded tensioner, and it's just kind of lost its And that thing's bouncing around. It's like a shop absorber. It's, 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 it's uh, with every rotation of that engine, that, that uh, tensioner's bouncing around. So spin the pulleys, f- figure out which one's making the noise, and it uh, shouldn't be too hard for you to figure out. Well, thanks for the call, Dan. 602-277-5827. We are going to go with Mark in Peoria on a 2008 Honda Tucson. Go ahead, Mark. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi, guys. Thank you. Um, I have a check engine light that works intermittently. I had my car into the dealership for service, and it came on, so they checked it. It said I needed, uh, well, the warning was the code was a torque converter, and the dealership, you know, doesn't do transmission work. They just replace transmissions. And uh, then I was getting a new battery at Pet Boys the other day, and my light was on again, and they told me also it was a torque converter. So my question is, rather than going all the way to Tri-City, is there a reputable transmission place on the west side of town? I live in Peoria. Is there a place in Glendale or Peoria you would recommend? And secondly, could this be something as simple as a, a sensor or something like that? I have no problem with shifting or uh, power or anything else when I'm driving. And how critical is it, and do I need to do something immediately? My light is off again. It's an intermittent uh, check engine light. Well, I got two answers for you. I'm perfectly certain that Tri-City Transmission is worth the drive. Okay. (laughs) Number one. And then number two, you had a battery replaced right around the same time, and uh, the code that you're getting is going to be like a PO740 or 741. And what the torque converter does, it's a connection between the engine and transmission. When you come up to a stoplight, 
the torque converter disconnects. It's no different than a clutch in a manual transmission. It it when you take your foot off the brake and give it gas, it engages. Well, it's only about ninety percent efficient until the clutch torque converter clutch TCC applies and it locks it up. So you get one turn in, you get one turn out. And what the computer is doing is recognizing it's not getting a full output out of that torque converter. So it, the engine says, "Hey, we put one in, and we're only getting." 0.95 out, so we may have a problem with the clutch. On the Hyundais, they are so sensitive to battery issues and alternator issues. I've seen those PO740 codes set on Hyundais just for battery issues, so definitely needs to be diagnosed. I mean, we're going to look at it in a scanner and see if we're getting complete lockup. I didn't catch how many miles you had on that Tucson, you know, if but but it is something where maybe the torque converter be replaced. It could be a solenoid, but more than likely, I would make sure the battery wasn't the issue. I mean, it happens a lot. Well, you just had the battery replaced, and, and, and that's the other thing is the battery, the new battery, have the, enough cold cranking amps? Does it have enough reserve capacity where when you're turning the key and the air conditioner's on and you want to start the car, it's not getting run down? They're ultra sensitive. We see a lot of check engine light problems that are just the battery. That's the where you've got to, to, to start, obviously. To start. Well, the other, and, and, and in all seriousness, we do have a shop. You can go to see Dave Denman at uh, Dave's Car Care. They can certainly handle that for you. But one of the things as a consumer, sometimes we pull in these little shops and we get a battery and we get a little piece of information that says, oh, you need a torque converter. If you go calling around, hey, what's the price on a torque converter? What's the price on a torque converter? No one's going to say, well, do you just need a battery? <laughs> you know, we could be, you know, that's asking for a service you don't necessarily need. It really needs to be diagnosed. And when you get those codes from the little auto auto parts store, whatever it is, it's just a starting place. It, it is not an answer by any means. Yeah, it's not. It doesn't condemn the torque converter is bad. It's something in that circuit or that 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 control system. So, thanks for the call, Mark. Do you want to go with Pat in Buckeye on a 2002 Suburban? Go ahead, Pat. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, I have a, a question on a mechanical problem on my Suburban, and I have a comment on alignment and tire pressure for you. Sure. Um, I I. I had the rear plate and seal replaced on the engine because it was leaking bad, and I have always had a knock in the engine when it would start cold. And uh, it was the O-ring on the oil pickup tube, and they dropped the oil pan and they replaced it, and now it's been about two months, and what I get is when you start it in the mornings, it'll build up to about 50 pounds and fluctuate between 40 and 50 rattle for a minute and then finally go away and stop fluctuating is that o-ring bad again wow or am i looking at something else well it that's hard to say i mean it it sounds like it was just recently done and i can't imagine that that o-ring would be bad and what was happening there with that old o-ring that was hardened up or dried is it was sucking air so you weren't getting getting full pressure it's trying to compress a foamy yeah, mixture of oil. So th- that's hard to say. Um, you know, that's one of those things where you've just got to hear it, and th- and that is not a uh, an easy job. That V8, you know, pulling that like you used to on the older generation Chevy V8 is not um, something where you just pull it down and uh, pop the oil pan off. That's that's a quite an involved job. It looks like there's been a couple of recalls here recently. Actually, three within the last month. Two from Toyota and uh, one from. Ford, the two from Toyota, one was for Lexus and Toyota Highlander. They were both for the vehicle dying and, you know, losing steering and that type of thing. Uh, And then the one from Ford is the steering coming disconnected. So anyway, when we come back, we're taking your calls at 602-277-5827. Well, good morning and welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Matt Allen and this other guy standing across from me is Dave Riccio. And like always, every Saturday morning, we are here helping you with your car. You Spark- sure a lot more perky than you were 45 minutes ago. Uh, for, I was even kind of ready to go home. Even 45 <laughs> seconds ago, I'm looking out the window. It's all gray, and I'm like, I don't know. I, I, I kind of enjoy it for a change. This seems like this uh, August, September have been pretty good for these kind of days. I'm enjoying the monsoon. Uh, I'm done with the heat. <laughs> I'm just sick of it being hot. Pretty soon, I'll be complaining that it's 60 degrees, but a day like today, I could just... Lounge. Do nothing. I that's did. A, I did a, nothing for three days last weekend, and I I can't do that this weekend. I, I gotta change a light bulb or do something around the house. Right. 
Well, up versus segment, we're going to go with Scott in Scottsdale. He owns a place, I guess, on a 2006 Toyota Tacoma. Go ahead, Scott. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, guys. Um, I only have 60,000 miles on my truck, and um, my check engine light came on. So um, I took it to AutoZone, and they put their little computer deal on there, and it, it came up with pressure control solenoid, um, electrical. And so I guess that's in the transmission. So I took it to the transmission place, and they checked it, too, and they came up with the same thing, pressure control solenoid. So they ordered one from um, Toyota and came in two days later. Um, and so when I brought it back to them, they dropped the pan, and they right away said, well, you know what, we're seeing some shavings in here, so we're going to need to uh, rebuild the engine, so you don't even need the, um, the solenoid. And so I'm just like, so it went from like 200 and some dollars, which I was expecting to pay, to now over 2000 And so I was thinking, well, I mean, it showed me this little piece of, um, you know, some, I don't know what it was, but I was just like, that's what's causing my problem. And, and so, I don't know, so I just want to, I guess, get a second opinion, but since they already put new fluid in and everything, is there, you know, they clean the pan and put new fluid, so is there any way I can get a second opinion on if I need my transmission rebuilt? It's, uh, did, did they go ahead and change the solenoid? No, he said, he goes, well, that's not even do it. He, he goes, because you need to have this whole thing rebuilt. Mm. I think sometimes people get a little overzealous on this one. And uh, EPC, electronic pressure control solenoid, was having an issue. The computer noticed a voltage error. The next step, if I was diagnosing it, would be to ohm out that solenoid and see if it ohmed out normally. I would check the wiring from the solenoid to the computer, make sure we've got good computer operation. But, uh, you know, that's an A340 transmission. Things are bulletproof. You know, at 60,000 miles, I would not expect to see much in the transmission pan. So, I mean, you know, and I'm not looking at it. Maybe there was stuff. Maybe there's some garbage in there, and maybe that's what fouled the solenoid. It's a possibility. But at that mileage, my first opinion would be go ahead and replace the solenoid. We've got new fluid in it, but let's try that first. Because when we remanufacture the transmission, we're going to replace that solenoid anyway. So it's certainly worth a try. I would not be scared to do that. Yeah, Scott, and if you go to bumper to bumper com, there's a list of, of uh, very qualified shops there, a couple in Scottsdale that can take care of your problem. But on a transmission problem like that, it, it's best to find a good, reputable transmission shop. And on the bumper to bumper radio.com, you'll see a link to Tri City Transmission uh, down in Tempe. It's it's worth the drive for that kind of specialty type of item. And for you in Scottsdale, I'm, I'm making the assumption in North Scottsdale, but just right down the 101, it's right there by Tempe Marketplace. Probably probably worth doing. Well, thanks for the call, Scott. We're going to go with Joanne in New River on a 2004 Honda Civic. Go ahead, Joanne. You're on bumper to bumper radio. Hey, um, I have a Honda that's had 240,000 miles on it, and the engine went out. So we had a new engine put in. Well, it had 70,000 miles on it, a used engine. And then um, we're still getting a check engine light on, and the then we'll get a um, where it runs hot. But it only happens after we have run the car for about 50 or 60 miles. And then we took it in for the check code testing, and um, it said uh, transmission. So then we had a guy tell us that the whole transmission needs replaced now. Well, you say you. So I don't know what to check. Well, you said you still had a check engine light. Did you have a? Was there anything happening or any problems that led up to this with the check engine light before the old engine went bad? Yes. Um, the, we kept getting the check engine light, and the car kept overheating. And um, it, we didn't. We would take it in, and the guy replaced like the radiator, and then something else, and something else. I forget what. I'm sorry, but um, it never solved the problem. And then it kept showing hot, and then one day it just quit running. So we had it towed to Honda. They said we needed a brand-new engine, and they wanted 6000 just for the engine. So we took it to a different place and had the engine replaced with a used engine. And so you have the same overheating issue after your used engine was installed? Yes, but okay. not as much as we did before. Sure. Well, I'm, I mean, a couple things I'm thinking. We need to know what the code is for to d determine what's going on with the transmission issue. But you've got the same thing that caused your old engine to blow up going on with the, the new or the used engine. So I'm thinking you've got to, you're going to be wanting to check radiator 
cooling fans, there's a condenser fan, a radiator fan. Make sure that those are working properly. I can't help but think of how many cases we've looked at at the Better Business Bureau, the Automotive Review Advisory Committee, where someone got an engine and the car still overheats. Well, the the engine got replaced because the car overheated, but it didn't overheat because the engine was bad. Something caused it to overheat. And in the auto repair, there's two things. There's what broke and why it broke. And if we don't or, find out why it broke, well, it's just going to break again. Or what caused it. Yeah, you're fixing the symptom, not the actual problem. So um, that's what I'm I'm thinking. we got two engines that overheat. We've done all these things. But there's something, maybe you know, like a cooling fan that's not working, causing it to overheat or something else going on. And you don't want a car to overheat because you can have this engine that's, you know, 70,000 miles for a Honda. It's barely broke in. You know, and maybe it's got an issue already. So, but, uh, and then the transmission issue, I don't believe is related to your overheat whatsoever. I think those are two separate things you got going on. Well, yeah, and it wouldn't be uncommon for someone to pinch a wire you're putting in the engine, depending on who's doing it, what type of shop it is. Um, you know, you've got to be careful. There's wiring harnesses and looms and stuff everywhere in these cars, and you've got to make sure they're all in their brackets. They're not pinched in between the, the bell housing or the transmission and the engine or underneath uh, a mount or something like that. There's going to be all kinds of different things. So I think somebody just needs to kind of reboot and start over and go back to basics and and then work yourself through the through the. Thanks for the call, Joanne. You can also send us an email at bumper to bumper radio dot com. Maybe we can follow up on some of the specifics. We're going to go with Erica in Sun City on a nineteen ninety eight Chevrolet Tahoe. Go ahead, Erica. You are on bumper to bumper radio. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. You bet. Uh, my husband and I are selling our cars in an effort to put those payments toward other things and get out of debt and so we're buying used cars right now and we just bought a 98 chevy tahoe and so i have a couple questions one is when buying new cars or old older cars what was the first thing that you would recommend that we do and second um with the the tahoe we were told that there is is shifting kind of hard and we were told that there is um in the transmission casing that there's some kind of leak um but it's not dripping any kind of fluid it's been dripping like maybe one drip a day, what and speed? I know absolutely nothing about this. So, <laughs> yeah, that's okay. What speed is the transmission shifting hard at? Does it happen at fifteen miles an hour or fifty miles an hour? Well, it's actually when it's slower, so more like thirty-five, forty. And is it all the time, or is it after a long drive? Um, actually, it's all the time. Okay. Well, um, I mean, typically, I mean, some of the hard shifts I see on Chevrolets uh, is when there's a code for a torque converter slip. It'll elevate the pressure in the transmission and make it bang hard into gears. But usually you're going to feel that more at slower speeds. Um, But there's internal leaks and there's external leaks. So someone said, you know, there may be some sort of leak, you know, inside the transmission. It's a hydraulic machine. There's all kinds of ports and passages and different clutch drums and servos and pistons and accumulators. And so they could be referring to a, you know, a, uh, I'm not sure what exactly, but maybe an accumulator leak in where we have a broken accumulator spring uh, that is causing it to have a hard shift. So it's definitely going to need to dial it into which gear you're having an issue with specifically. And uh, some of that, a good transmission shop can figure out it really just in an interview and a test drive. And, but I don't think we're necessarily referring to a leak down on the ground. So it's not going to leak you're going to see. Yeah, well, she said she has one drip occasionally, but that's probably totally unrelated. This is not what they're talking about, an external leak. An external leak. But the, her other question was, hey, we're looking at we're buying used cars to save money and get out of debt, which I think is a great idea. Uh, but when we do buy a used car, I think you have to you know, do your shopping, see what a good used car is going to be. But oftentimes you got to buy that car, and then you got to go catch it up on all the maintenance that wasn't done from the last guy that was putting it off because he knew he was going to sell it. Well, yeah, I mean, it's. I, I tell people, I mean, I guess one thing, don't go in a hurry to buy a car. That's when people get in the big problem. It's like going to the grocery store hungry. <laughs> you come about, don't That's go. exactly what it's don't like. Don't take your money with you. You know what I mean? Because you're going to buy, because you're going to find something about it, you know, that sparkly this or that right. or whatever. But, but, yeah, take the car. What I always tell people, if if you have kids, take everybody, go load up the car and go for a 30 minute drive, how you're going to use the car and get it out on a long test drive and make sure it's a car that you like. And like you said, Dave, well, besides the first and foremost, having it checked out by a shop that uh, knows what they're looking for and can kind of nitpick the car apart. Uh, And, and then 
like you said, Dave, they're not people don't like fix everything on the car and then just go get rid of it and say, oh, uh, it needs all this work. Let's just fix it and then I'll sell it. But how many times so, do you hear that people buy cars and said, oh, they've just done everything? To oh, the everything's car. done. Yeah, everything to the car has been done. I mean, I hear that every time people come in. Oh, I bought this car. They've done everything to it, but it does need to be checked out. And uh, you know, some if you're going to look at c- having the vehicle for a long time, you may look at you know if it's got a hundred thousand miles on it, does it need hoses? Does it need a radiator? Is there anything I can do if I'm going to have this car for another four or five years? And, and if, especially if you're buying a seventy or eighty, ninety thousand mile car, take a thousand dollars of your budget and set that aside, and just shop for a little bit less expensive car. If your new car budget or your used car budget is eight thousand dollars, buy a sixty five hundred dollar car. So you get some money to put into it. Yeah, get a, get a little cushion and. Get your maintenance, make sure your maintenance is caught up and current and, and have some uh, room for error, I guess. And I would say in the long run, it is cheaper to drive an older car with some miles on it versus driving a fancy new car in the driveway. I mean, that's the Dave Ramsey math, but it, it makes more sense. The tags are cheaper. You know, there's there's less to it. And the nice thing about driving an older car is you can pick the parking spot right in front of the door of the grocery store because <laughs> you're not worried about anybody denting or dinging that thing. If I buy a new car, next thing you know, I'm parking, you know, a hundred yards away from the front door, just so nobody dents the and, thing. And you're the guy that takes up two spaces, right? <laughs> I'm not that guy. <laughs> not that guy. Speaking of older cars, there's a. I like old Volkswagens and Porsches, and there is a Volkswagen. If you like old cars, old Volkswagen German cars, there's a Volkswagen car show November second. I think it's out at the uh, cornfields there, 99th Avenue, McDowell, uh, called Volkstock. I think they've got a website, Volkstock dot com or something like that i'll get you some more details on it but it uh, might be a cool fun family event to check out well erica thanks so much for the call we've got wally mike ralph and tony and we're getting to some of those texts during the breaks and we appreciate them you're listening to bumper to bumper radio well welcome back to bumper to bumper radio i am dave riccio here along with my sometimes friend matt allen and we are here helping you with your car and uh, we got a text since we're speaking about tune-up today on Mr. Uh, 07 Nissan Altima four-cylinder. It says, the dealer parts department wants 25 bucks for one spark plug. Can I buy the spark plugs from AutoZone? And uh, I wanted to bring up dealer parts versus aftermarket parts. A lot of the dealer parts come from... The aftermarket companies, or or you would think of them as aftermarket. They're not in a Nissan box, but what is a f- factory spark plug on a Nissan? Well, Dave, I always say that Nissan, BMW, Toyota, they don't make anything. <laughs> All they do is take a bunch of parts that they've designed and put out for bid... And, they have and then once they put all those parts together, now they have a Toyota. Now <laughs> they have a BMW. But until then, it was just a bunch of parts made by Aki Bono, made by NGK, made by Mitsubishi, made by Siemens, made by some vendor that Bosch. made the Bosch, made, some vendor made the wiring harness for, for whatever. But in the case of the spark plugs, or any other part for that matter, a lot of parts, in this case, the spark plug wires and the spark plugs and a lot of the electronics on that Nissan are NGK. Mm. So you're going to go to the dealer and buy a spark plug. It's going to come in a red, white, and blue Nissan box, and and it will probably say NGK on there. And you're going to pull out an NGK spark plug that has the Nissan logo on it. Then you're going to go to AutoZone, BAP, uh, O'Reilly, Napa, wherever, and you can go get the NGK spark plug. Same difference. Same same spark plug. Now, at the aftermarket, they might have three different NGK spark plugs. Mm-hmm. They might have the basic one that wears out in 30,000 miles, the iridium, the platinum, the palladium, whatever. The balonium. Yeah. The uh, balonium carbide. B- the balonium, yeah. <laughs> Just as long as it's not green balonium. Uh, so, well, spark plugs is one of those things, but I do want to bring up one thing that you don't want to go aftermarket on, and that's mounts. I, I've never found a good aftermarket mount from somewhere other than the factory. So going to actually Nissan and buying a Nissan mount, uh, not necessarily the dealer, but Nissan mount. Yes, you, you want, yeah, th- that's one area where I would never go aftermarket. But on the spark plug, so to answer the, the text question was, can I go to AutoZone? I think AutoZone has NGK spark plugs, so you would want to get what the original spark plug is. Toyota, it's Nip and Denso. General Motors product, it's AC Delco. Uh, Chrysler product, it's a champion. Audi might be a champion, might be an NGK, might be a Bosch. There's, so there's there's different variations, but I would stick with the original equipment electronics. Right, for sure. Well, we are going to go with Wally in Gilbert 
on a 2003 Pontiac Grand Prix. Go ahead, Wally. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'd, I'd like to say thank you for taking my call, but I have, it's a 2003 Pontiac Grand Prix GT, 155,000 miles on it. I have changed the transmission oil and oil on it about every 10 to 15,000 miles. Uh, I'm an ex mechanic, that's why I do that. But what I've noticed lately is that uh, when I go to take off, sometimes it will shift one and then go, it'll go one, one, two, and three, you know, real, like real quick. And then I'd have to hit down into the throttle harder to get it to come back down into second gear. And what my question is, is there a way to adjust the shift points on this transmission? More than likely, just off the top of my head, that's a 4T65 at 2003. Really, the shift points come from the computer. It's going to look at throttle position, how much your foot is in the gas, and it's going to look at vehicle speed. It's going to compare those two, and based off programming and mapping, it's going to shift the car based off those two. That's not to say we don't have a bad speed sensor. That's not to say we don't have a bad throttle position sensor that's causing it to shift earlier. But there's no, I mean, you could get into the software and the programming, and we're able to do it on our end where we can go in and change the programming, but it's not something we're normally doing because the factory software is pretty smart. So they put a lot of time and effort into when those shift points should be. Now, if that was a 1973 Grand Prix or an 83 oh, Grand yeah, Prix, yeah, we would just we would change the governor gear, belt. put some bigger weights in there, bigger springs, do whatever, adjust the TV cable. We could definitely do that, but on the late model stuff, it's really done in the computer. And that goes back to our original topic with the tune-ups. The computer is the one that's handling all these adjustments. It's pre-programmed in. They're even adjusting for wear and tear. The denigration of the of all the systems is programmed into the mapping system or 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 the uh the running for sure now even before the break i asked you uh or we were talking about hey when was the last time you adjusted an idle screw on a car <laughs> doesn't not, hardly happen not right very often some of the imports have some funky little air conditioning idle speeds and different things that you can adjust but you're not you're not twisting screws and turning things and doing much anymore we are going to go with Mike in Chandler on a 2011 Toyota Sequoia. Go ahead, Mike. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking the call. You Appreciate bet. it. Uh, okay, quick question. Um, so, like you said, it's it's uh, an 11 Sienna XLE. Um, I've got 40, low 40,000 miles on it, and the car has been absolutely bulletproof. Now, all of a sudden, when you turn the air conditioning on and it's coming from behind the dash on the passenger side, you get a nasty rattle and and vibration, and it's coming definitely from the passenger side. It's it's, a, it's really loud, really nasty, and you can tweak it, though. If you start going through the air conditioning modes, start messing with uh, high, low, you can get it to subside, and then it'll go quiet, and then it'll come back with, like, a vengeance. And even when you shut the air off, uh, it, it, it slowly slows, but still rattles and hits pretty good. Even with no, even with the fan not running. No, 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 no. Once you turn it off, and then you can hear it slowing down. Okay. You, you, you know, you know what I mean. It, 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 in other words, if I shut it off, it doesn't just stop. It's almost like a like a ceiling fan hitting something, and then it's when that's once it comes to a complete standstill, the noise goes away. Well, my my gut feeling is that there's something stuck in the fan. Now, that car's got a cabin air filter, but it wouldn't be uncommon on cars without a cabin air filter. You see a napkin and get sucked mm-hmm. up into the little wrapper. into the dash or, or some kind of wrapper. Maybe a leave or something came from, uh, from the outside on the windshield cowling, depending on where you're parking your car. That's what I would be thinking. There's something that's got in there, and it's like a spoke on the wheels of a bicycle. It's just tick, 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 tick. It's, it's, uh, it's rubbing. You can maybe pop out the cabin air filter. Now, I know I had this happen on my – I have a 2010 Toyota Tundra. And when we changed out the cabin air filter, a piece of debris fell down in past the filter and caused the noise. We had to pull the squirrel cage out or pull the little motor out and, uh, you know, get that junk out of the, out of the fan blade. I'm, so yeah, I'm thinking that, that's what's that, going that's, on. That's got to be what it is. There could be a – you just don't see the problems on Toyotas like you do on the General Motors cars with the uh, mode doors flipping and, and opening and closing and getting, getting stuck, those those gears stripping out. So that's where I would be going up in the dash there and looking looking at the air intake for the recirculating of the AC. 
Well, thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoy the overcast day. We appreciate all the phone calls. And uh, one I did want to, we had a text here, how often do I service a manual transmission? Every 30 to 50,000 miles is pretty normal. Some of them say lifetime fill. Not a big fan of that. If you got questions about that, bumper to bumperradio.com. There's a list of great shops there if you're looking for one. Thank you, Peter, for running the dials. Remember never to text and drive. I'm Dave Riccio. He is Matt Allen. And you can reach us anytime at bumper to bumperradio.com. See you next week. <laughs>